this time on episode 414 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're going to discuss the 1992 X-Men animated series, season 2, episodes 6 through 9. We're going to discuss some background of X-Men supervising producer Will Mignon. And we're going to talk weekly Marvel news, including Patrick Stewart's statement on the Multiverse of Madness trailer, where you have to move to in order to see the Marvel Netflix Defender show in mid-March, and Deborah Ann Wall's new project. I'm Chris Farrell from the All Things Good and Nerdy podcast, a wacky weekend morning show, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out right now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and the opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the shield director. Now it's time for a scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're a Marvel Comic Universe fan show discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes as told on screen by Marvel Studios. The show is recorded on Thursday, February 24th, 2022. Happy birthday, SP sister out there. And we're live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and we're broadcasting Fox Kids Wide via www.geeks.live. Come and join our live chat as we record. Gang, happy National World Bartender Day. Actually, it's just happy World Bartender Day. I love bartenders. I haven't been to a bar in a long time. But you should tip your bartender and not use them as a free therapist. So true story. Today, I had to go to, well, it was a sports bar, but a bar. I had to go to a bar because one of my employees retired. After work, we went out to a bar and we were talking and stuff like that. But we all had to order drinks. And, you know, in this day and age, they have the electronic pads to pay for stuff. And it's really neat because you can choose what kind of tip to put on there, percentage-wise, dollar amount, that sort of thing, or put in your own, right? But it's really neat when you're like looking at it going, hey, that button is the amount that I would tip, and you just press that button, and it just happens that way. Now, it's a little bit more complicated on the back end for these people. It's not like the neighborhood bars of old where they just, you know, compiled the cash and took, you know, split the cash or stuff like that. But at least it's easy for me to remember to tip my bartender. Cool. The bartender is probably, I'm going to say, the second hardest working person in a restaurant behind only the dishwashers. And back when I was washing dishes, me and the bartenders were real tight because we all knew the crap that everybody else was about to put us through. So I'm always curious about what the tip sharing community pot or whatever it is is in a restaurant or bar and i think it's different from place to place but don't think when you're tipping always keep in the back of your mind you might be tipping the entire staff so if so if one if the entire staff is nice but like your one server is not completely on the ball or something like just taking the entire rest of the experience into account as well i'm you know just be kind i guess right and remember that your server and bartender has nothing to do with how well your food tastes. That's true. All right. So that's World Bartender Day. I don't go to bars very much. It just so happened I was at one today, but I don't really. As a matter of fact, that might have been my first time in a bar in close to two years. Yeah. Something like that. All right. Anyway, so we're going to get talking about the rest of the show because we love talking about marvel because of bees if you'd like to talk to us about bees you should head on over to our website legendsofshield.com 
you like to talk to us about how you like your coffee black and covered with bees, you can leave us a voice note, 844 the bus one That's 844-843-2871. If you have any really cool beehives that you want to show off, maybe you should get some pictures and tag us in the post that you make on Twitter. If you want to do that, you should hit Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. on Twitter. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash gunnageek. And if you want to argue with us about the best species of bee, I'm not sure what my favorite is, but head on over to the Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. Remember, bees are important and they need to be saved. And Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. We're short one agent tonight. I just want to give a big shout out to Agent Lauren. She is on special assignment. Very, very special assignment. Hopefully she'll be able to divulge a little bit when she gets back next week. She really wanted to join this recording. I just want to say that, but she just couldn't. So we're hoping to have her back next week. Now we've got a whole bunch of X-Men, the animated series stuff to go through. I'm excited about this week. You guys excited about it? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go then. So I'm really excited about talking about X-Men, the animated series. And for those of you that don't know, what we're doing is we're marching down the X-Men, the animated series that aired in 1992 on because next year in 2023 the x-men animated series 97 will occur so i don't know if they're going to call it x-men 97 season one or x-men the animated series season six i don't know i don't care so far i've been having a good time i've heard season five is a little rough but we'll get there when we get there meantime we have chosen to spotlight some of the creative team behind the scenes So we get to know a little bit more about the great people that put on this series that was so instrumental to many, including Chris. This show is so wonderful and really my first experience with the entire X-Men world. And Michelle. This is one of the things that got me into comic books. And Lauren would have something similar to say. I did not watch it when it came out, but I am enjoying it now. Anyway. We have gone over Margaret Lesh, who was the person that ordered the show, very much the protagonist behind the show. She was the Fox Kids executive, the person in charge of Fox Kids. So she was the one who ordered it. We talked about the song composer because the intro is so instrumental to everybody who's watched this show. His name was Ron Wasserman. He also did the Power Rangers, Go Go Power Rangers, or Mighty Morphin Power Rangers theme song. And we also talked about the Fox Kids executive that was in charge of the show. He wasn't the showrunner, but he was the Fox Kids Network producer in charge of the show. His name was Sidney I Wanter, and he was instrumental in a bunch of stuff that happened with the show. This week, we are also going to talk about somebody that was instrumental in getting the show off the ground. He was involved in the show in season one. His name is Will Mignot. And that's spelled, by the way, M-E-U-G-N-I-O-T. I I did get the pronunciation right, but that's the last time I'm going to say his last name. I'm going to call him Will from now on. Anyway, so Will was involved. He was deeply a comic book expert, we'll say, but he was also trusted by both the comic book industry and the television industry because of all of his past projects. So he served as an instrumental go-between. That was his key position within the X-Men, the animated series series. So let's talk a little bit about Will. He also worked on the failed Pride of the X-Men pilot. He's very much an X-Men and wanted to be a part of the pilot, was a very instrumental part of the pilot. But what everybody that was involved with the pilot will say is it failed because they didn't have creative control of the show. And there was a whole bunch of things that happened with the show that they would have fought against if they had the opportunity. They did not. And that was one of the many, many reasons why that show failed. There was the pilot made, but that was it. He knew the history of the comic books. He didn't write the show Bible, though. That went to Eric Leewald. So we'll talk about him in a later episode. But what Will 
said here is he was excited about this project because they had creative control over the project. As you will see later when I talk about this in a few minutes, this led to some confrontations, even with Stan Lee, which is big in how this was able to pull off. What Will also did is he was a storyboard artist and he was able to create the intro credits with Larry Houston. And we're talking about Larry Houston probably next week, but certain things about the credits can be accredited to Will. And one of the things is as the characters are being introduced, you know, the names get flown in from the sides. That was Will's idea to do. And there's a whole story about how the intro credits were made. The studio did not want all of those different characters to be in the credits. Credits ran for 75 seconds, I believe, is what they said at the time. And I think it's a little shorter now. I don't, I'd have to time it again. But they said it was 75 credits. A whole bunch of different characters were introduced basically in the credits and that actually led to the issue with stan lee later but will was instrumental in that and the credits alone sold the series so will and larry were very instrumental in making this series be bought by fox and even though margaret lesh was going to do it no matter what the credits are what actually showed people this is what we're going to do and so they went with it and they made some corrections of how things wanted to happen after that. But that's how that happened. So let's get into some of the confrontations and the conflicts that he was involved in. Like I said, he was a trusted agent on both sides. So he was able to talk to both sides in a manner which they could relate to. And one of the things was the character design. Now, Chris, I don't think we talked about the art in the character design before. I mean, we might have peripherally talked about it, but we haven't talked about it in detail yet, right? Yeah, we definitely haven't done a deep dive into it. I don't plan to do it right now. All I will tell you is that there was a discussion over which style to go through. And because they didn't have all the money to draw the characters as they were in the comics at the time, they decided to go with the Jim Lee style, but there was a big fight over that. And part of it was because Jim Lee and a whole bunch of artists were leaving Marvel for image comics. So the studio didn't want to use their art and give them credit. Go figure. It's an ongoing thing even today with Disney, right? So he put his foot down basically and drew the characters that they wanted in such a horrendous way that they're like, no, no, let's, let's go back to that. So he did a little trickery in order to get what he wanted. So there was another thing that happened at the time, and we've talked about it quite a bit. You pick a show, GI Joe Transformers, whatever cartoon, it was basically out there to sell toys. Well, there are very strict regulations at the time to not have the show specifically there to sell toys or merchandise. And the companies involved had had a contract with the Australian distributor to do some sort of McDonald's toy deal. You know, I don't know if it's done anymore. My kids aren't young anymore, but you used to get these toys with like Happy Meals and stuff like that. And so I think it was one of those things that they were doing a product placement deal. But the action figures, I guess they were, were so bad. They were like walkie talkies glued to heads. And Will's like, nobody, do, no, nobody like glues a walkie talkie to their head. That's just, it doesn't happen. And they wanted X-Men drapes to be in the mansion and different characters sleeping in their own onesie pajamas and stuff like that on screen. He's like, no, nobody does that. I'm not going to do that. So he put it down, put his foot down and he threatened to quit over this. He said, look, if I'm not your guy to do this, that's fine. But if you do this, I am leaving the show. This, we can't have this. This is not comic book appropriate. Well, I would say today, maybe it is depending on the character, right? In the comics, like sometimes they're entrenched in their own merchandise, right? For whatever reason. I mean, even on this show, we covered Luke Cage and Luke Cage had his, uh, had his own merchandise, right, Michelle? 
Exactly. And one could probably say, if Deadpool was on the show, that would make sense. Everyone's favorite X-Man character, Deadpool. Let's not forget that. He won that battle, basically. He threat to quit over it, and Marvel was finally like, yeah, man. And I think threatening to quit got the right people to take a look at what was being suggested or directed, saying, no, this is not good. All right, here's the other thing that was very interesting for me to learn. You guys know Stanley? I mean, you know of him, right? Of course. I have a vague idea. So Stanley pretty much the godfather of a lot of Marvel comics, right? Creator of a lot of the comic book characters and in charge of Marvel back in the early 90s, right? So he wanted to have his voice in the introduction explaining the characters and their background and the lesson that they were going to do at the beginning of the episode. Kind of like a little bit what he did with Spider-Man, but more engaged, I guess, the Spider-Man animated series of comic whatever that was back then in the 80s and 90s well they fought against it they said no this is not the right feel for the show this is not what we want this show to be we want this show to be a little bit more sophisticated of course stan lee was upset at the time but he finally acquiesced it got everybody involved the studios involved and everybody's like yeah actually this is it not and this was another one where will said i'm going to leave all of the people involved said, yeah, as much as we like Stan, and they all did like Stan, like, we can't do this. So those were three huge battles that Will fought and won in order to make this series. Now, he might have fought other battles and lost, but then nobody's talking about it, right? But these are the three big battles that were fought and really shaped the show. So I think that what he did to stand up for the show and the characters really resonated with people like you two in order to have the series the way it is. Thank if you like the series the way it is, I would go ahead and, you know, thank Will. He's retired now, he lives with his wife. At least that's the last information I have. After season one, I've learned that they all thought the show was not going to get renewed. So they all started working on other things. Will moved on to co-produce uh, the Exo Squad in Conan, and he was really involved in Conan. He was so involved, actually, that he didn't have time for X-Men. He really wanted to work X-Men, but he didn't have time. So they reduced his role from supervising producer to consultant, basically, after the first season. Then, after that, he eventually moved on to Graz Entertainment. Now, a couple of episodes ago, or it might have been last week, you guys remember I said I didn't remember the two companies that were involved with the Saban Entertainment. You guys remember that? Right. Yep. Well, I remember them because it came up in this research. He started to working with Graz Entertainment. Then that is the company that Saban subcontracted with for several shows, including X-Men. Will was able to continue his involvement with X-Men at a lower level, but at a super as a animation supervisor, basically, with Graz Entertainment, which meant that he was flying back and forth to South Korea to the other company that was involved called ACOM. And ACOM, A-K-O-M, was an animation company. Will was going back and forth supervising the Conan stuff predominantly, but since he was over there, he also was able to direct correctly in the right direction, at least until season five. So seasons three and four, he was able to do that for X-Men, the animated series. So he's involved the entire time through. So you guys impressed with my in understanding of Will or more appropriately, Will's involvement of the show? I'm glad he won. I love Stan Lee, but being told what the show was, the episode was going to be about before the episode. I don't need, I think I would have felt talked down to, like, you know, like I, I, let me figure it out. Let me get my own meaning from it. And that's specifically what Sydney I want her, the Fox executive did not want. Chris, what do you think about Will? I'm really happy that they didn't really go with that Jim Lee art style because I mean, it works in comics. I don't think it would work for a cartoon. I think it was too complex for the cartoons at the time. All right. 
let's move on to the actual episodes that we watched this week, which were episodes six through nine of the second season. Previously on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. This is like what it feels like to read a comic. You got these little self-contained stories, but an overarching one that makes you want to buy the next issue. I've been having a blast watching this with, you know, <laughs> odd years of of distance and seeing what my impressions now are from when I was younger. I think my opinion has definitely evolved on a lot of the characters. I'm watching the series for this first time as an old man. Gray in my beard. I'm watching it. I'm really enjoying it. More is dead in the first episode. I hated his little laugh. I just, <clears throat> I hated him. And now I have these conflicting stories in my head. X-Men is Marvel's greatest superhero soap opera. Mr. Sinister. This is a new character for me. Mr. Sinister is what happens when shippers go to the extreme. They have the same goal. They want the same things to happen. It's just a matter of how are they going to get there. And thank you, Chris, for assembling that previously on this week. Hey, thank you, SP, for the wonderful video to go with that around some intentionally tricky audio points. Indeed. Well, I was able to do it, so hopefully we'll be able to continue to do it in the future weeks. This week, we watched episode... Six of season two, externally yours, that aired Saturday, December 4th, 1993. Season two, episode seven, Time Fugitives, part one, aired Saturday, December 11th, 1993. Don't worry, it wasn't a mid season finale because part two, season two, episode eight, Time Fugitives, part two, aired on Saturday, December 18th, 1993. And then bringing in the new year, season two, episode nine, A Rogue's Tale, aired on Saturday, January 8th. 1994. Well, what happened on these episodes? Well, here's a short synopsis of each. Externally yours, every 10 years, the Assassin's Guild and the Thieves Guilds must each give an offering to a supernatural being called the External in exchange for power. Gambit's brother Bobby, who has to offer the tithing this time, comes up missing. The Assassin's Guild wants to exchange Bobby for Gambit so Remy can finally come face to face with the woman he left at the altar 10 years before. Time Fugitives Part 1 Bishop returns from the future to again attempt to fix his world, but this time his actions lead up to a far greater tragedy occurring. Time Fugitives Part 2 To stabilize his own timeline, Cable comes to the present to prevent Bishop from saving mutant kind from Apocalypse's plague. A Rogue's Tale Mr. Sinister sends Mystique to destroy the X-Men while Professor X is lost in the Savage Land. Rogue starts having painful visions of a mysterious woman and the mysterious woman tries to possess Rogue's body. Unknown to the X-Men, this mystery woman holds some dark secrets to Rogue's past before she joined the X-Men. I have a question, quick question to ask you guys. Do you watch one episode a night like Chris said he did a couple of weeks ago? Or do you binge watch it all at once? Chris, what'd you do this week? This time I had to watch multiples, but I wasn't really paying enough attention to what was coming up. Because of me recording for my other show, we watched Externally Yours and then Time Fugitives Part 1 and then had to stop and wait for the next night to pick up the other two episodes. How difficult was that? Well, on one hand, I really wanted to keep watching. But I also had to be there for the recording, so it's not like I had a choice. Michelle, how about you? All at once. Yeah, I watched it all at once, too, a couple of nights ago. All right, let's talk about our first thoughts, Michelle. This coffee cup. Think of it as the space-time continuum. Whenever you go back in time, it breaks. Now, you can reset the timeline. You can try to fix it, but no matter how hard you try... It's never going to be exactly how it was. Jay Garrick, Flash, Season 3, Episode 2, Paradox. Pulling out the CW reference. All right, Chris, what do you think? I think these four episodes matched up thematically a lot better than any of these sets of episodes we've looked at before. Everything is here a look at the past. 
and how that affects what's going on now. And really just the fact that you can't escape the past that you've had and trying to escape it is probably going to make even worse things pop up instead than what you already had. I love time travel episodes and more importantly, time travel episodes that are quasi time loop episodes. So this was like, woohoo. And then to end it off with my revelation, because I never knew about this before about Rogue's relationship with Captain Marvel. And I say Ms. Marvel because that's what she was called back then in the comics. We're talking about Carol Danvers. But Rogue and Captain Marvel, we see that. And my questions are answered of why Rogue's powers are the way she is. So we're going to talk about that all in a second. We're going to start off talking about time loops. Oh, boy. I know, SP, you love this, but it's, as I said, you go back and you try to fix it. You don't know what you did. I liked how in Cable's time you had this time storm and the timeline trying to correct itself because in actuality that would happen if something would change that rate then either some sort of weird time branch is going to happen and something is destroyed. There's the whole multiverse idea of this. There's the idea that there's only one timeline, so it has to correct itself all the time. And how they did it, bringing back Bishop. I liked the previously on the previously ons for these four episodes were great because it gave us a nice highlight of what happened before. And even though we just watched days of future past a couple of weeks ago, if you were watching this, you know, actually when they were airing, it would have been a year ago. So having those nice little, that nice little summary of like, Oh yes, Bishop did go back in time in order to try to fix it. And then we find out that, oh, he fixed one thing, but then there's a plague and forge showing that when you are in the timeline, you don't know what happened. Because he just said to Bishop, I wasn't out of time like you were. I have no idea what you experienced. Normally, I hate club shows because I think they are really lazy and just a time filler that they could have just made a, a silly beach episode about if anybody is familiar with like anime pausing of stuff. But I feel like the episodes here, Time Fugitive, you have that reused footage, but it's a really, really good reason for doing it because Bishop is coming back in time to look at the same thing and then coming back in time to look at the same thing again. So of course you're going to have some of the same events happen. And if you're doing that, go ahead and save your costs and reuse some animation. I didn't think of it in terms of a, a money saving or a time saving, which is actually mo probably more important in this case, time saving vehicle. But it does make sense that if they were reusing that same footage for time saving thing, I do know that alley where they appear every episode, right? With Bishop appears where Cable ends up appearing is overused in all three episodes days of future past and then these two i love time travel episodes like i said before so i was all in as soon as i you know as soon as i saw the titles i knew i was in for a good ride but i liked the fact in the future where cable is and the whole timeline's being rewritten you know his son just you know disappears like marty mcfly is disappearing on stage you know when he's back to the future I don't know if the disappearance had anything to do with Back to the Future, but it was something that was at least in common vernacular at the time for kids if they happen to see Back to the Future. So maybe that's why they chose to do it that way. Anyway, it, I have slight issues with that because, you know, all time is going to change right away, but they did show the whole thing changing, you know, getting wiped basically by the time storm. Yeah, that was a thing that happened. They went through it not once, but twice. And they showed that it's not all there. Michelle, like you said, I love Forge. And he was like, hey, nothing changed. It's it's uh, the way it's always been. And Bishop's like, either 
depending on what episode, it's either like, yeah, it's still broken. Send me back. Send me back. And Forge is like, okay. And then the last time he's like, yeah, okay. Things are good. And they walk off into the sunset sort of thing. And, and Cable also gets the sun back in the future. Let's go to the first episode, Gambit's episode. I am completely not have any background with Gambit. So I came into this like, okay, well, here, what's Gambit? What's his past? They went into it. They showed his family and in, in the two gangs, the thieves and the uh, assassins, right? And they were showing how they interact back and forth. But I have no background here whatsoever. So I got, I got to lean on you guys. Was this an accurate description at the comics and the time of Gambit and his background? Chris, I'll start with you. I'm not huge on my Gambit knowledge. I do know the Gambit being in the Thieves Guild is a accurate thing. And I do know that the Assassin's Guild being their nemesis there is an accurate thing. Pretty much beyond that, it's just something I haven't really looked into a lot. His relationship with Belladonna is comics accurate. Comic writers often, they go back and they try to bring in more depth, change a few things. There was a point where Gambit wanted to go back with Belladonna. Like they really were trying to sell the love triangle. You actually see Rogue be a bit jealous when they go try to rescue Gambit. And Belladonna did have more of a pull on him in the comics. I cannot remember if Belladonna comes back in the animated series. So I would be surprised if she did. I can't remember everything. I just can't. But her and his relationship being difficult and having a lot of bumps, that is comics accurate. Oh, cool. So one of the things that I noticed at the beginning of the episode, and I should have, if I would have known, I would have I started a Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. counter as to how many times we get the X-Men shirtless in the series. This episode starts with Cyclops getting his clock handed to him and in the danger room because Gambit is being distracted by a phone call about what's going on here with the tithe. And Cyclops ends up with his shirt almost completely ripped off before they're able to save him. So that's one for this block of four episodes. There's at least one more. I didn't specifically count them all out, but at some point in time, I may go back and we just might start a Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. shirtless X-Men counter for X-Men the Animated Series. What do you think about that, Michelle? Her to me is really on board with that. I'm a K-pop fan and male K-pop idols. Some of them have what I call a condition called a shirt allergy. I am convinced that patient zero is rain. What a shirt allergy is, is the guy has a jacket. It'd be like a regular jacket. It could be like a suit, the suit jacket and no shirt. Absolutely no shirt. Kai from EXO is another one known for this. Taman from Shiny and Mino from Shiny have also had this condition. There's some members of NCT 127 having this condition as well. BTS, however, seems to not have this condition at all. So go figure. But yeah, so the K-pop fan in me is like, yes, let's go back and do a shirtless. Do a shirtless counter. I'm just disappointed that we didn't bring this up to you because both us and Lauren should have known better and really pitched this idea to you before we started. Well, we'll just have to go back and uh, count them. And, you know, Chris, you just have to go back and watch these again and oh, then darn. count them and then let us know. But you and your wife will have to, to pay close attention and let us know how many shirtless scenes there are. And then we'll just keep on going from here on out. Another thing that I want to talk about or have somebody else talk to me about is external like this was another like mr sinister i had no background in until this series and i only have this series background of sinister i have no background in external so chris what's with external externals is another one that i just don't have a lot of knowledge on 
there's a ton of Marvel stuff. You can't know everything. But I do know that Apocalypse is an external, so what they're really doing is condensing an entire group of people into this one character. And I can't remember if they ever really expand on that or not. I agree. I can't tell you the name of the external that was in the episode. And by then, here's the thing. When I was reading X-Men during this time, the external part of it really wasn't in the forefront. A lot of stuff I was reading was dealing with a lot of like Magneto and there was Charles Xavier's son and some other things. I don't want to spoil stuff, but really the external part of it, I, it wasn't really a big thing. So I don't know a lot about that. All right. So let's move on to the two-parter. We were talking about time travel, but we're always talking about some virus. Right, some virus that enables mutants to stabilize and go on in the future. I will say at this point in time in 2022, we've been two years into the pandemic by now. It's a little bit eerie watching stuff like this. And it's like they're almost prophetic of the future. It's like, I, I don't know if I really want to watch it, but the episode is so good. So I'll watch it all the way through. You guys feel the same way or is that just me? Oh, completely. When they start talking about the plague and they did the whole quarantine and I'm just going, I haven't been out of my house because of the current COVID situation. And this is, why is this feeling real again? This show is 30 years old and here we go, a quarantine, a plague, racism, all this type of thing. Because with COVID, a whole bunch of ugliness has come out. And with this plague, a whole bunch of ugliness came out. It was just, it's still, it's so true. I can't believe it. It's just, I can't believe it. The thing that really caught mine and my wife's attention was that you had those mutants who were already basically quarantined, stayed up in the building, and the Friends of Humanity we're out there trying to get them out of the building. Like, if you want people to quarantine and get rid of this virus, they're already quarantining themselves. Just board the doors up so they can't get out. Yeah, but you got to remember, since we're two years into the pandemic, there's been a bunch of arguments back and forth, whether they're scientifically based or not. Some people want their personal freedom, some don't. I mean, this has been so out of the norm like michelle was saying this is not supposed to be a playbook right and this turned into a hey this is what's going to happen in the future it is really eerie and scary from that perspective but it does tend to start explaining stuff to kids right so you're telling kids that you know stay with the scientific evidence basically right that's at least the, one of the messages that I got off. Also, we had a discussion a few episodes back about Wolverine and Wolverine, could he get colds or not? Well, this episode goes into the fact that Wolverine was used to basically cure the plague by him getting infected and then his advanced healing systems were able to create the antibodies. Again, I think he can get a cold, but it's not going to last very long. So in that episode before, when he was out in the Ar Antarctic, Arctic, Arctic, and he comes back, he's still got the cold. I guess it depends on how fast he gets back to the mansion. And, you know, so this is comic. So we'll say a couple minutes. So he's got the cold, but it only lasts for like a couple of hours, if that. And in this case, because you only have so much time, you can't go into like, oh, he's fighting this for days or weeks or months or something like that. It happens within like, I don't know, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, maybe. That he's able to do it. So his powers do extend to viruses. I never doubted that. I just said it wouldn't be instantaneous that he would have to deal with it. And Cable using that fact and being able to go, I think I can save 
Bishop's timeline and my timeline at the same time. I was clever. At this point in time, 1993, 1994, end of 1993, beginning of 1994, we still don't know much about Cable in the comics, right? Uh... We know a little more than the show is letting us know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. Uh, you know the Eagle song, I Can't Tell You Why? That's the theme song for this episode for us. I know a little bit more about Cable than I've known about Sinister or the Externals or anything like that. So I think I know where you guys are going with this. I'm not a total comic heathen, but I'm for the viewer that might be stringing along, I'm not going to say anything. So I'm just going to ask, eventually, is this explained in the show? I, I can't, actually can't remember. remember. I think it is because of something that I read in one of the research things that I did for the creative team. But I, I don't know for sure. So, all right. Well, I can't go any further. I need to talk about Rogue and Captain Marvel or Carol Danvers, Ms. Marvel at this point in time. I did not, I was not aware of the storyline. I know we got a couple of listeners going, SP, it's, Captain Marvel is your favorite character. How did you not know this? Because I didn't. I, I didn't know. I had no idea. And this is comic book accurate. This is a story that actually happened and might still happen in the MCU, mind you, once Rogue gets introduced, and I'm just guessing eventually Rogue's going to get introduced, that this actually happens. So the two of them are combined, basically, because Rogue's powers, being able to steal power, so she basically steals Carol Danvers' powers, and now has Carol Danvers' or Captain Marvel, or in this iteration, Ms. Marvel's powers. That's why she's able to fly around. That's why she's so strong. And that is why her powers extend beyond just stealing powers from others. So it's explained in my mind at this point in time. I've always been a rogue fan, but I was like, it's kind of weird to me. But now I understand. And I really like the link to Captain Marvel because, well, I'm a Carol Danvers fan. So yay me. This is why we couldn't say anything. Thank you. Because I was totally surprised when I watched it. I'm like. Okay, so the episode's titled, what, Rogue's Tale, and I didn't read the description before I started watching it or anything, and I'm getting through it, and all of a sudden I'm seeing Ms. Marvel out there, and I'm like, wait a minute, Ms. Marvel, I might, yeah, I'm a little vague here, but that's Carol Danvers, right? So I'm like, oh, woohoo! So I just watched the episode like I would have if I was, I don't know, 12, watching the episode going, wow, this is cool. Thank you for not spoiling it. Chris, what did you think? Carol has a lot of X-Men connections. A lot of them I'm not going to get into here, both because of thematic reasons, and I don't want to spoil anything that I can't remember if it comes up in the show or not. But there is so much possibility for her to keep popping up with X-Men related things. Yeah, and I did do a little research because, you know, I was so intrigued. I did do a little research. I mean, it's impossible for me not to get to completely spoiled. So I think I'm picking up on some of the things that you're talking about. And if this does come to pass, I think we can see Brie Larson or some iteration of Carol Danvers in the MCU for quite some time based on a projection. If the mutants are brought about in, I don't know, phase six, seven, eight, something like that, that Carol Danvers will be around for a while. So whether it's Brie Larson or somebody else, I, hope that they keep the character around because i really like the character that's just my personal wish there yeah going on about rogue those of us who knew this when the x-men movies were coming out anna paquin you did a great job it's just it took that part out of rogue they did give her the struggle of i can't touch someone i'm denied this human connection but they also left out that part of what makes Rogue Rogue, which is that being manipulated by Mystique, the whole needing a found family. This is her second found family. She's kicked out because of her father. She's taken in by Mama, who we learn is Mystique training her, thinking, this woman's helping me. I have a found family again. Instead of being betrayed. 
And the films didn't bring that in. Instead, we had her having a crush on Iceman or something. I can't remember. And then eventually getting tempted by The Cure. But it really took that, that part of Rogue out. And that's one of the reasons why I like the movies. But there was so much that they could have done that this show does. It's like, if you did not like the X-Men movies and you're not sure, watch this show. This is an excellent adaptation of the comics. It is a great representation of the characters and the themes and the stories. Yeah. Carol just, I think, needs to be there at the beginning of that rogue thing. And if it's not Carol, they could have just picked some off-the-wall, strong, flying mutant, because it seems like every Marvel hero has super strength somehow, unless they have a specific reason not to have it. So they could have stayed away from Carol entirely, but still gotten the essence of it, and that could have worked. But this is just, once again, the cartoon doing so much better in such a super condensed timeline that I think, quite frankly, it's ridiculous how much better this is than those live action movies. And it's made for kids between six and 11. It's not made for adults. So it's kind of amazing that they're able to pull a lot of these themes out as they are. Now it's still produced for kids, right? You still get the classic late eighties, early nineties overacting and, some things and everything, but I enjoy it. Okay. The second to last thing that I want to talk about is Xavier and Magneto. So we see them at the end of the first episode of Gambit, but then we don't see them for the next three episodes. Savage Land is only in the Gambit episode, and it's not in the time travel episodes, and it's not in the Rogue's Tale episode. They're out there, they're having their trials and tribulations, and I'm hoping that we're going to see them again starting in the next episode, but they have been out for three episodes, which they're not totally forgotten, though, because in the Rogue episode, Xavier is referenced because of the mind things that he's able to help Rogue with, which I don't know if I'm comfortable with that, but at least it keeps Xavier in our minds, (laughs) pun intended, in that episode. We're going to see them hopefully next episode. I don't know. Again, this is the first time I come through this and I don't watch ahead. So I have not seen the next series of episodes. Are you guys okay with those two being gone for those three episodes? I am. Again, this is how comic books work. Sometimes you have the whole team. Sometimes you have a few members of the team doing one thing while the others go off somewhere. Then the next issue will be about those characters that weren't in the previous one. And by dropping hints, it lets people know that, Oh, Charles is away doing something and they're still trying to find them. And then we see Jean. I liked how they were able to bring Jean up to the forefront really showing what she can do. I don't want to spoil that, but I think that's a really good way of setting up what's going to happen next season. That's all I'm going to say. Might have also been a movie, basically. Yeah. Just the fact that they're up here dropping these Claremontian plot threads is something that I can really appreciate. You know, you're watching this show and... Yeah, you know, even if Charles Xavier is your favorite character, first off, I don't know what's wrong with you because you have everybody else. But, you know, you don't forget that they're there. They keep getting reminded. And I just have to say it now to make sure I get this chance to say it. There is a good reason why there is the famous panel of Kitty Pride saying that Charles Xavier is a jerk. Can't disagree with that, but also there are some people that can identify with the old rich guy that's able to control everything. Personally, I'm not talking about me. I'm not. But there are people that are like, yeah, I want to be in charge of everything. I want to be that old guy that that does that. But are their eyebrows as nice as Charles Xavier's in this series? 
let's be honest. I'd rather be Cap Marvel or Rogue. I mean, it's, it's I think they're infinitely better characters. The last thing I wanted to say is I just wanted to close up the loop here and say that there was a second shirtless scene. It was Wolverine as he was going through the virus thing. So there's two shirtless X-Men in these four episodes. So we'll just add that to whatever count. We'll go two plus whatever happened before. We'll, we'll update you next week. Okay. And I'll be sure to watch these again, just in case you missed one in these four episodes. I'm sure I did. <laughs> I like these episodes. I can't wait for the next four episodes, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to finish off season two next time and just go from there. So, Michelle, what do you think? Talking about Charles Xavier, Kitty Price saying he's a jerk. You know. Why have therapy when you could just have Charles Xavier go into your mind and wall up all your problems? <laughs> Pretty much, though. I mean, he's trying to do what he thinks is right, and he's trying to protect the mutants that he has decided are essentially his children. And a lot of times, I think what he does is ending up on something that would be right at home on either the subreddits Entitled Parents or Raised by Narcissists. All right, so next time we're going to talk Season 2 of X-Men the Animated Series, Episodes 10 through 13. If you're watching along, please watch the episodes and let us know what you think. We'll talk about it on the show next week. Let's talk about some Marvel Studio news. We heard from Patrick Stewart himself. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We got to go back to last episode. For those that may not have listened to last episode, watched last episode, or listened all the way to the end, when Chris was talking about the trailer that aired during the Super Bowl of Multiverse of Madness, he had not listened to the voice at the end, and we refused to tell him about the voice at the end. Well, right after the show, he watched the trailer and immediately texted us so that we knew he watched the trailer. So, Chris, please now continue. So, we heard from Patrick Stewart himself about what is going on with this Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness trailer, which sent Marvel fans into a frenzy when it debuted, specifically his part where X-Men fans were abuzz over the scene that seemingly included the voice of everyone's favorite bald starship captain returning to his role as professor x as i alluded to Stuart currently is on a star trek show i haven't seen it i heard it's good well you've not seen any of Stuart's star trek stuff no just this new one i've seen next generation stuff yeah i'm not that bad please continue okay so while he was discussing some stuff about his return as John Luke Picard with comicbook.com. He also made a little comment about the voice we heard in the Doctor Strange trailer. But according to Stuart, that's all it was, was just something that sounded like his voice, possibly someone else. He dashed all of my hopes and dreams by saying, you know, people have been imitating my voice ever since I came onto the stage 60 years ago. So I can't be held responsible for that. I refuse to believe that he has been doing things for 60 years because I don't like that passage of time. It's incredible when you go back to watch the original Dune and you see him in the original Dune and you see him in Star Trek The Next Generation or any of the Star Trek movies or the Professor X from the... He's the same guy. He looks the same. He, he's ageless, but he started looking old, you know? He's... I would say immortal, but I know he's not because, well, we... None of us really are. Anyway, I heard the voice on the trailer. I was like, oh, this is so cool. Professor X is in and the mutants can now be a part of the whole thing. But this article that we lifted this off from comicbook.com kind of dashed my dreams a little bit. And I was like, oh, this might be true. So, Chris, go ahead. Professor X's presumed appearance in the Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness recast the character 
as part of the shadowy Marvel organization called the Illuminati. They are also people who like to take control of everything and run the entire world, just like the regular Illuminati, which may or may not exist depending on your belief in conspiracy theories. Lots of movies and material out there about the Illuminati. I'm unfamiliar. I think I've read a couple of comics with the Illuminati in it, but it's not something that I'm really big into. So I got to do some looking into that because I have heard that the Illuminati is going to be in Multiverse of Madness. And I just would like to go in with some background into it. Not that I have to have it comic book accurate or anything like that, but I'd just like to know before going in. I think i'm okay with this and the reason why i'm okay and michelle you can chime in in a second here the reason i'm okay is logan and we i believe reviewed logan on the show i was completely okay with logan logan was done fantastically and it was the last fox x-men mutant show that i watched i have not seen the dark phoenix movie the last one that fox did yet but i watched logan it was well done it closed off both his character and wolverine I'm fine with that. So if they want to move on to continue to use Patrick Stewart, but in another aspect, I'm fine with it. I'd actually be fine because I trust Kevin Feige. And I know I shouldn't. I shouldn't blindly trust him, but I do because he's taken us this far. I would be fine if it was Professor Xavier as well. So either way, I'm okay with it. And I'm kind of hoping that it's more the Illuminati because of Logan in the end that that was. But I don't know. Michelle, what do you think? I think recasting the X-Men, if they're brought into the MCU, is perfectly fine. Okay. I think 90% of recasting is perfectly fine. Patrick Stewart needs to stay. You got to think of longevity. So how long did phase one through three last? 2008 till 2019, right? 11 years? 10 years, yeah. yeah. So is Patrick Stewart going to be able to be with us in acting for 10 years? Charles Xavier has faked his death and come back to life at least 9,000 times in the comics. They could recast when it needs to happen. Okay. I was going to ask, are you comfortable with CGI at this point? I am not. You know, I, I know Disney and Star Wars had their things they had to work through with Princess Leia and Carrie Fisher, and I appreciate what they did. But I kind of don't want to go in knowing that this is probably a a possibility because they just haven't showed me that it is perfect. Yeah, finishing something that's already started, I'm going to be almost 100% cool with no matter what. A small enough role, you know, we'll just have to figure out what a small enough role is. I like how we're just glossing over McAvoy, completely just glossing over. You know, we talk about Fassbender's Magneto. I think his, you know, I think his Magneto, I love Ian McKellen. I think what they did with, I think the writing and the storyline for Magneto with Fassbender was better. But we have McAvoy there as Xavier. And I just like how both of you are just like, let's just ignore it. He's not the Xavier we're looking for. You can't completely ignore it because I like Deadpool. And Ryan Reynolds addressed it specifically in Deadpool, right? So it's like you can't completely ignore it. You have to say it's there. Out of the two, I mean, Patrick Stewart by far is the way better actor out of the two. You know, Shakespearean train and all that. But I honestly, I was fine with either. I, I'd be fine with either going forward. And you're absolutely right. I didn't think about it until you said it. McAvoy could be injected for the MCU. Who knows? Maybe we'll see McAvoy in Multiverse of Badness. I don't know what they got. Maybe we can get both of them together. Yeah. Mm, I wanted to say something, but I couldn't. Okay. I'm looking forward to this. We're going to cover it in May. Uh, Hopefully. I don't know. We'll have to talk about it. There might still be... We'll cover it at some point, so... We'll have to talk about whether we're comfortable going into the theater or not. I'm not going to mandate everybody go, so if nobody wants to go, then we'll have to wait till it comes out. In video, streaming, is presumably on Disney+. Plus. Which, incidentally, I was at Best Buy buying some piece of technology today on the way home, and what did I see in there but externals, Blu-rays and DVDs and stuff like that. So, they still do that. All right, 
I'm going to move on to our next news point, which is also big since this does affect the origins of the show being an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast. We talked last time about the fact that somebody sussed out that Netflix is no longer going to show Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or any of the Netflix Defender series on 1 March, which as we record this is just in four days. There was a news story that came out a couple days ago that Daredevil, Punisher, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, and the Defenders is going to be available March 16th on Disney Plus in Canada. Kaylee got the backpacks. We're got to go. Okay. As we were talking before the show, Michelle, I could see the, the you, you, you know, you're like, should I move? Should I stay? Should I move? I, I could see the concern in your face. So we were talking about it on the show. Actually, this is good news. And the reason why it's good news, in my opinion, and you guys could defer with me, it's good news because it tells me that Disney has the rights to stream the show. So if it's going to be on Disney Plus in Canada, they can stream the show. So what's different between Disney Plus in Canada and Disney Plus in the United States is the United States, Disney Plus is kind of capped at PG-13. It's, it's just an arbitrary internal cap that they have, but it is an internal cap, right? What they have proven to me is they can stream it and they own the property. So if they want to keep Disney Plus at PG-13 level, and we could argue left, right, and backwards, but I will argue that the Defenders are, for the majority, rated R. Certain episodes are definitely rated R, right? That they could air it on another service that they own, which could possibly be something like Hulu. So if they have the rights, they can place it wherever they want to. And I'm okay with that, because that could mean that in a couple of weeks after March 16th, or maybe on March 16th, they're going to announce it. Maybe they're waiting for some big announcement like after it leaves Netflix, because maybe they don't want to feed Netflix any views, right? So they just want to go, if you're the Disney Corporation, you're like, just want to go quietly into that good night. I don't want to give them any more views because it's a competing company, right? But March 1st or March 2nd, we're going to announce that we're going to stream it here and here. Now, the reason that this was sussed out is because there was an announcement actually on Disney Plus in Canada saying these are shows that are coming. It's just a shows that are coming list. There was no like trailer or anything like that. At least not that I read. So I'm okay with it. Michelle, you okay with this? Yeah, I like the fact that they are acknowledging their existence. I know Charlie Cox was in No Way Home. We can't avoid that. He's been talking about it and such. And if they still have those properties and they're showing those properties. They're not hiding them like the Inhumans. You remember that show? That show is just like gone. I think Kevin Feige is just like, let's put that under the rug. It doesn't exist. I think it was streaming on Disney Plus for a while. I don't know if it's streaming on Disney Plus now. I haven't looked for it. Even if it is, no one talks about it. <laughs> Except for me right now. They're acknowledging that these shows exist and that's something that is good that maybe we're maybe that you know we got kingpin in hawkeye so if they're showing those shows on disney plus in canada then perhaps we can start to take the leap that that is our kingpin from the daredevil show that we've watched that is the daredevil and spider-man that we watched on netflix I'm definitely cool with them doing this, except for the part where I want to live in Canada anyway. So this is just another reason that's being shoved in my face that Canada is better. But the only thing I wonder about is if rights in Canada would be different than rights here. I know sometimes that's the case when you get into like European countries or something. I don't think Canada is going to have much of a different list of what you can show and what you can't compared to us since a lot of that tv movie culture is pretty crossy over i'm sure there's a better word for that but i can't think of it right now so it does give me hope that we will be able to see them 
on something here in the United States at a future date. Yeah, if it's available in the United States, I do plan to watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or rewatch it later this year as soon as it becomes available or shortly thereafter. It's the next series I want to binge and go through and, and just re-experience it by myself because I've been podcasting on it since 2013, I believe, is when the show came out. And I would like to go back and just revisit it. All right, Michelle, talking about the Netflix Defenders, you have a very interesting and nice news story. Well, one of my favorites, Deborah Ann Wall, is going to have a new Dungeons and Dragons show. Deborah Ann Wall will appear in a new ongoing Dungeons and Dragons live play series. Wall is a longtime D&D enthusiast. She previously developed and starred in the Geek and Sundry series Relics and Rarities, which featured Charlie Cox as a guest on The Ascent of the Angler Parts 1 and 2. Wall will serve as the Dungeon Master of Children of Arte. She'll be joined by veteran TTRPG live play cast members Hope Lavelle, Alicia Marie, Adam Bradford, Lauren Urban, and Jennifer Kretschmer. Children of Arte launches on May 15th on, Dream- on Demi Plains, which channel a preview of the show will air on March 8th. I am in, I am enthused for this show. Not only is she a great actor, I watched Relics and Rarities where she actually had a guest on who really wasn't a, a D&D person. And it was great seeing Charlie on there, especially with their relationship. He was hilarious. She knows the game. She's an amazing storyteller. Amazing. The only reason why Relics, Relics and Rarities did not continue is because of Geek and Sundry kind of imploded for a little bit because a certain show decided to leave and do its own thing and blah, blah, blah. I am happy about this demo plane. It has some great shows. I know this cast because I'm I was a Heroes of the Plains and everything. So it's a good cast with an amazing storyteller at its helm. I've just started getting into playing D D and this is really enticing to me because I liked her Karen Page character. That's the only thing I've seen her in. So it I I don't feel like I can really judge somebody's acting ability too, too much based on one show, but she did a really good job there. And seeing a bunch of celebrities just come out these days as giant nerds has been really fun. Since Michelle broke the seal on the Charlie Cox news, which I've been deliberately avoiding for months, I don't know why, but I mean, it's out there. We haven't seen Spider-Man. Michelle, both Michelle and I have not seen Spider-Man. Chris, I don't think you've seen Spider-Man. I have not seen it either. Yeah. So we've been deliberately avoiding talking about Spider-Man until we see the show. But I have been so spoiled on it. It's impossible. You can't look at news for the show without running into at least one news story about Charlie Cox and his appearance in Spider-Man. The thing about Deborah Ann Wall is the entire cast of Daredevil and several other actors all are campaigning to have Deborah Ann Wall as Karen Page rejoin the MCU. I think that would be tremendous. I think that would be great. In the meantime, I'm glad that she's doing anything and having fun with it and getting more exposure because she is very talented and has a lot to share. She's got a personal story to tell, for sure, but her professional work is deserving of watching and you know i'm not a big playthrough watcher just because of the time that you have to invest in any show so you're listening to this podcast i think the longest episode we ever did was close to two hours we're normally more like 45 minutes to an hour 15 minutes somewhere in there any playthrough podcast that's out there is like two hours to three hours right so that's the time that you have to invest in this and it is an investment. It is well worth it for a lot of the stories that are being told. I just don't have the time for that. So I'm not saying they're bad. I just don't have the time for it. So I, I don't personally do it, but I know a lot of people do. And there are a lot of great podcasts and playthroughs out there that are streamed. And I actually am thinking about putting this on my list because 
she's good enough that I'd like to do it. I did see some of her stuff on the Geek and Sundry, so yeah, I, I would uh, go all in on this. And again, for those at Marvel Studios that are listening to the show, because I know you do every week, please put Deborah Ann Wall back in the MCU. Please. Don't make me call Twitter's favorite troll and bear Gail Simone to make this happen. She would. She would totally make it happen. All right. So that's it for the news this week. And we are going to collectively, because we're nice and kind individuals, and uh, because I just want to, we're going to swing by the hospital, pay a visit to Kara Danvers, and get on out of here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this week. We got another great week planned for next week with the X-Men and whatever news comes out to talk about. So give us, drop us a line. Give us a call. Let us know what you think about our episodes. Let us know what you think about X-Men. Let us know what you think about the MCU. And actually, we're coming up on March, so we might be seeing and reviewing Spider-Man really soon. So get us your thoughts about Spider-Man. Yeah, thank you for downloading, listening to us, and interacting with us. We always appreciate it. You can find me on Twitter at shell underscore game. You can find the playlist on the Nerds with Dice YouTube for our, our Rift's Ballad of Fate in case you would like to watch a wacky and emotional playthrough of it's a Rift system. It is not the D&D system, but it's the same thing. You roll dice and you tell a story and it's all fun. And thank you to everybody who tells us things about the show, whether they like it, things they think we can do better. The fact that nobody has commented on the fact that I'm wearing the same three shirts every time we record this show. And if you like to hear other things from me, Easiest place is to go over to Play Comics, where the latest episode as we are recording this, I talk to Alan Dunford about his Kickstarter project, Pocus Hocus, number three, which magically changed the font on all of the Play Comics logos when it came out. <laughs> and Chris, I thought it was the same shirt. I didn't have any illusions that there was three shirts. I thought it was the same shirt. And because you were so enthralled with your first performance you've yet to wash it well yeah that's just because i'm lazy though too oh i thought it was like a superstitious super bowl thing or something like that well it's my special podcasting shirt i also have my special podcasting hat for when i actually let my hair grow a little bit and it's messy how do you wear headphones with a hat uh just kind of stretch the band out a little bit and put it over the hat yeah as we leave today i just want to say again congratulations lauren i'm really happy for you and hopefully you can talk about it next time we'll see everybody next time bye 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 thank you for listening if you want to leave us feedback go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of Shield, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2022.